go ahead and kick this off. So um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to Mike, who's our SAB lead, and he's going to walk us through some of the points that they've discussed. Um, and, and instead of going through all the complete list um, and then having discussion, um, let, let's try, um, you know, you can, you can talk about a main point and then we can see if there's any further discussion we want to have on that point. And then we can move on to the, the next point. So, and we can see how this is going um, yeah. go from there. So, so Mike, I will let you take it away. And okay. And you. SAP members, like I said, please uh, step in if I say something wrong or didn't, not expressing it uh, as well as I should. But, uh, okay. So um, we had a number of things, but I just highlighted the ones in red that are the most, um, probably uh, most pertinent. And, but these, these are not in order of priority either. These just sort of random, randomly uh, ordered. So the first one would be, um, let's see, uh, it, as it's come quite a bit, concerns about the dividing the roles of DTC and EPIC. Um, the SAB recommends that the transition from DTC to the EPIC contractor uh, should be gradual. Um, a lot of relationship with DTC has been have been developed in terms of getting uh, user support and stuff like that. And uh, and there's a concern that Epic uh, wouldn't be able to step into that role right away. That it should be, uh, you know, a couple of years or so, or it shouldn't be just a sudden handover. That there should be that uh, uh, transition should be gradual. So, and, and I'll just chime in at that point. I, I think we're all on the same page here because we, we don't want any support to be degraded. Um, and so, it, it, you know, we will be trying to work through that carefully. And, and I would say it's definitely not going to be instantaneous, is not our anticipation. So um, we did receive some funding from the EPIC program office to, to work on this transition. And, you know, they, they gave us at least, a, you know, this, this first increment of funding, um, it had a performance period of more than a year. So um, I, think, I think we're on the same page there. Okay. Oh. Just jotting some notes on paper. All right. Uh, next, uh, D, okay, DTC should be made aware that Met Plus is not, is not widely used uh, throughout the, uh, the, the, the community. Uh, NOAA, other people, academia, uh, private industry. Um, if it's DTC's priority that, uh, that Met Plus be widely used, then they should investigate why, why this is, um, either through better promotion, um, better training, or at least find, maybe find out why it's not being widely used. And um, and actively stepping in to, to, um, to you know, to, to correct that, to correct that problem. I think a lot of people want to, uh, you know, want to, you know, want to use it, or they don't under, if they have their own tools, uh, verification tools, they not, might not be convinced yet why to, they should step over to MEP and MEP Plus. But, uh, but maybe that's, uh, DTC should, you know, maybe study this through, uh, uh, um, I, I don't know, sending out surveys or something like that okay. um, to find out why that why that is, so that it could be more widely used. So, Tara, did you want to? Yeah. Um, so, we are aware that the Met Plus is not widely used in the U.S. Um, academic community. Um, it is becoming more widely used within NOAA, but there's a there's a whole bunch of people in NOAA the need to, to learn how to use it. It is actually fairly widely used internationally. 66% of our um, of our uh, registered users up, up until the point where we stopped take, um, keeping track of it uh, were international. 33% um, were US based. So that perspective is um, a little bit skewed. Um, but I, I can completely appreciate what you're saying. And we um, are actually very committed to trying to, to have more um, use um, okay. for the, so last year, our funding was focused on um, uh, running the metrics workshop, um, which was, you know, requested 
uh, by the, the UFS. And, and so that was um, our outreach funding. That's, that's what um, it went towards. This year, we have funding for a tutorial and a workshop, a, a MET Plus users workshop. Rather than uh, the original intent was to have it be a one one week kind of um, training and workshop together in in residence sometime you know in like the the spring, but it's um, it has become very clear to us that um, one there's no guarantees that we'll be able to do something in person in the spring, and two there is a great need um, to um, to get back to doing training. Um, we used to have in-person trainings like one, every every year or every other year, and, and we um, had to stop that for a couple of years due to funding issues. Um, so what we're planning on doing this year is starting in um, late October, early November, is starting a, a um, like a weekly training seminar series. Um, so the, the tutorial is going to be um, virtual weekly small chunks um, recorded so that people can go back and and um, you know, follow up if they miss a week or something like that. We're intending on having it um, on Hera for um, NOAA users, and then for the community, supporting um, you know, and probably it has to be somewhat limited. People have to register, but supporting um, users on, in the cloud. Um, we will you know, similar to what we did with the the workshop this summer. Um, Give, uh, give people credentials to use for that day while we're doing the training and then shut down all the instances afterwards because we don't want to accrue uh, charges and, and so forth. So we are starting a, a training seminar series um, late October, early November. As soon as we get the, the date firmed up, then I'll be sending out an announcement. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that we, we do need to um, continue to understand what's standing in the way. Um, mm, okay. Yeah, sounds like the process is well underway. Yeah, and and I would say as 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 the SAB puts together the report, if if you have any ideas about how to make uh, that those inroads of outreach, um, you know, we we would definitely welcome some insights on you know how how can we have our reach uh, get deeper within the academic community. Um, you know, those are those are those are things that we would we'd definitely welcome. And, and I'd just like to also point out that um, uh, basically MET Plus has been giving a, given a, um, a substantial ask um, with a fairly limited budget in comparison to some of the other aspects of the UFS. Um, and, and so it's, it, we're, we, there's a lot of tension, you know, between how much do we put towards training and how much do we put towards development, especially um, to, uh, support the S2S community, which is the next big push. Um, you know, what basically every day I'm on a call, I'll, you know, generally what I hear is we're not getting the S2S diagnostics in fast enough. So somehow we have to figure out how to balance all of those. And, and, um, it's, a, it's really challenging to, to do it on the, the budget that we have. <clears throat> okay. Thanks for asking though. I appreciate, um, the discussion. Sure. Is any, anyone else have anything to add, SAB, or, or should I move on to the next point? Okay, I'll move on. Um, let's see. Uh, this is poorly written. Compensation barrier shouldn't be the first bullet or, or sentence or whatever. But uh, <clears throat> can DTC use its strength in single column model, modeling to help um, uh, in tuning of new schemes? In relation to existing schemes to eliminate compensating errors. So this is, you know, uh, uh, someone comes up with a new uh, improved uh, parameterization, um, puts it into the model, and the skill scores uh, go down. Well, e even though his the, the person's uh, parameterization was more physically realistic, um, it degrades the forecast because of uh, comp of errors in in other parameterizations that were used to sort of uh, you know, compensate to to improve the skill scores. Well, now that's all thrown out of balance. Um, um, can uh, uh, DTC provide uh, I guess, uh, help in the feedback of of tuning the other uh, these other parameterizations that have fallen out of balance? Can they help in the process uh, in the single column modeling to um, 
uh, you know, incorporate new parameterizations that are more physically reasonable, but upset the balance of all the other uh, the, the other tunings. So, so I have a, a just sort of a clarification question with respect to this, um, and and that is, I, I I'm getting the feeling that it's like um, not that it's it's in some respects beefing up the capabilities of what is possible with the single column model or are you thinking more in terms of of the dtc taking and applying the single column model for a developer that I'm, I'm trying to or is it some mix of both um let's see probably a mix of both does anyone want to speak out on this yeah i would say it's a mix of both and I would go further and say, this is an actual question. Can you do it? It's if folks in the DTC can define areas where they think they can productively apply, say, some of the past experience with data assimilation into this, and there's a lot of expertise within the DTC. The question is, can the people within the DTC come up with a way to help address this perpetual problem? that a lot of users might be encountering when they're trying to introduce new schemes via the, the single column model. Okay. It can be anything. I, my, my read on it is that this could be anything where you think you collectively think you can, you can make a difference. Okay. Is, and, and if any of the other DTC staff have questions or thoughts, clarification, uh, Please speak up or raise your hand. Evan. So uh, I'll say that um, I, I think, you know, a lot of DTC staff would love to contribute to eliminating some of these compensating errors in the modeling system, whether it's by contributing a new development or by doing these tuning uh, exercises. I, I will say that it's probably a growth area for DTC. I mean, I, I think that at least initially, we would probably have to partner with at least some of the physics developers who really know where the knobs are in the modeling system to, that can be used for effective tuning. Um, but I, I think it's a, an intriguing area of investigation that we could make an impact on. Uh, I think it would just require some probably additional knowledge on the part of the staff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 I didn't mention any of the background material, but we are in the process of trying to plan a staff retreat. And, and, and part of what is being talked about is, you know, how do we, how do we provide growth areas for our staff? And, you know their their own development, um, and and I think a lot of our staff would would welcome being able to figure out how to have some development and really be able to have more more impact in this area. So so it's definitely an intriguing idea, um, and we welcome that. Okay. Anybody else on this point? Okay, it sounds like we can. Yeah, we'll move on here. Um, let's see. Coordination amongst the different test beds and better advertisement on DTC Smart. Um, yeah, we can be in a roll and trying to remember what this one was about. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think we, <laughs> these were in, in, in my in, initial thoughts, but uh, they, I, I should, delete this but there it's not we, we weren't saying that DTC should take on the role of being like the central um, hub of all test bed centers across the you know across the world um, but this was just ab about um, um, you know how, how can we find out or, or better coordinate amongst the different test beds such as the hazardous weather test beds and others um, um, uh, to, to, to clarify, you know, who does what and 
and, and so on. Who, does anyone want to pipe in on this? I can't remember if this was still supposed to be a, a major point or not. Chris? Yeah, I brought it up. Um, okay. And I think I sort of talked about it before we broke out uh, into our, uh, you know, SAB only session. But um, I, I was just trying to figure out when it, it it came from Christiana's talk about understanding or getting more involved with the community and kind of understanding what's going on uh, for R two O projects. And I wasn't, and I, and I agree with what Michael was saying about not having, you know, not being in control. It's, it has nothing to do with that. It was just, and maybe you could better advertise what you're doing at TC, at DTC by advertising what's going on with the activities in the test beds to the broader community. And I'm not sure how that would be done. It was just. A thought that was brought up and looks like Israel wants to respond to that. Yeah, I was going to say, Israel, you might have some comments here. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make a comment on this topic. Uh, you know, DTC's role with HWT has been fairly clear in the past. There's been funded projects where you guys have contributed, you know, verification aspects, um, contributed to CAM Ensemble development and, and some of the systems that we evaluate. So. I think maybe the, the comment here is more like HWT has a well-defined experimental period where we bring in uh, the, the community, basically. So I think when there's things that DTC is doing that, you know, where feedback could be welcome from, from the community to advertise those opportunities more and to, you know, just have a, have a clear communication strategy on, um, rather than just kind of doing the testing yourself, but maybe bringing in um, and having, you know, set, um, whether you call it experiments or whatever it might be, so, something more like that, where it's a little clearer to the community what's what's being tested, what's going on, and to provide be able to provide feedback to those activities. Yeah, I, I have wondered if there might, if it, we might benefit from um, having, more intentional discussions as as like HWT or HMT are are ramping up for their yearly experiment that we understand better about what you're looking at and and how much overlap that might be with any focus areas that we're working on and and maybe just having a little more intentional communication about it because we're not always overlapping about what we're looking at um, but. Um, and also being aware of what's being planned as we go into any planning cycle that we have. Um, we have tried to do that off and on in the past. Um, it definitely hasn't been perfect. Um, and, and, I, and I have to provide a little hysterical <laughs> uh, context, and that is that um, in the very early days, we started off down a pathway of having a close collaboration with um, HWT years ago. Um, and then we got some guidance from the SAB that that was a distraction. We needed to focus more on what we were doing. And so, all the, you know, so we did a big turn and, and weren't connected with the test beds anymore. And then we've then more recently been coming back and, and trying to have, have that connection. So, um, so I take it positive that, you know, if, if you're recommending we should, um, Try and be better coordinated, have better connections and communication, and by all means, put that in your report because um, we'll take that to heart. Okay, sounds good. Um, all right, the next one is sort of a non incomplete uh, clarification on DTC's uh, provided services. Um, uh, Will you be providing software tools, tools only or running model experiments? And I think we've sort of talked about that earlier with the uh, sort of the single column model framework that um, th that would be as a you know manpower uh, uh, allowing um, uh, scenario. Um, 
thing. Yeah. But if I if I could chime in on this point for just a minute, and and I I'd like a reality check, even from my even from the staff and from the science advisory board. I mean, I've been with the DTC for a long time, um, and to me, what I had always envisioned is that um, you know we have we have these tools, community tools that we can offer to the community that we're providing support for, and so I I kind of always hoped that we would get to the point where where there's sort of a full spectrum of what's going on. So some people, we might not be working very closely collaboratively on running, you know, they're running their experiments. They're running their experiments, but they're using our tools. So then when they present results, we're all on the same page. We understand what they're talking about. Um, but then there would be, you know, another, another part of the spectrum would be that, um, you know, we would be, um, collaborating maybe it might be a looser collaboration but but having some type of collaboration and then to the end of, other end of the spectrum where we have some very close collaborations where maybe um we have subject matter experts that we're working with but maybe we're running the experiments and doing the evaluation but but we have this feedback of information that they're providing us insights with respect to you know their knowledge of oh that yeah that makes sense that's why it's doing this or or mm, I don't understand why it's doing that. Maybe we need to run another experiment sort of thing. And, and so for a full-blown facility where we're really supporting the community, it seems like you would want to have that full spectrum of activities going on. Um, and, and we've never quite gotten to that point. Um, so I'm just curious if anybody has any thoughts about whether that's a realistic vision or not. No takers. <laughs> well, at least if I could ask a question then is, yeah. do you have both the human and the financial resources to do both of those things? I think if we can get away from having to do this really basic software support where we're running the regression tests, we're running, you know, this really, the stuff that we're really hoping to hand off to Epic would, so I don't, in my overview talk i did a thought experiment and it would free up millions of dollars to do that kind of work um if you if if you were to hand all of it off now i'm i'm, I'm saying that it's going to be somewhere in the middle probably um sort of thing but um you know it it, it could be a sizable chunk of funds julio does uh dtc have staff right now that is kind of i mean are, are there people who are scientifically, you know, enabled to do this kind of evaluation without a lot of input from developers? So I, I would, I mean, I, I think we have great scientific expertise. There's, uh, depending on what we're looking at, um, I think there is, we will need to grow in areas, but um, I guess what I, I would say is that I don't ever foresee that we would be working in isolation from the developers, that for this process, based on our, my experience since I joined this effort back in 2003, that it doesn't make sense for us to work in isolation, that we should be connected with the developers for all types of activities that we're working on, that it just makes it... Um, more informative um, because it needs to be an iterative process. We can't just take something off the shelf and test it and expect it to work. Well, it might run, but it might not work as well as we want it to. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, should uh, DTC should DTC move away from software development only in T and E and become a T and E clearinghouse. Um, DTC should uh, define exactly what they want to do uh, in T and E update to, to com uh, community. I guess this is regarding uh, about communications and also uh, uh, um, uh, DTC. 
uh, providing the, um, uh, I guess, um, uh, more of the tools for the, uh, not just the software tools, but for uh, uh, writing new t and &E, um, uh, methods that are out there. Um, see, Clark, did, you're the one that brought this up, but uh, this has been mentioned a few times. Do, are you able to uh, elaborate a little more? Yeah, so I can try to elaborate a little bit more. And I apologize if anything that I might share has already come up in the group discussion. I just got out of another 30-minute uh, meeting uh, that I couldn't avoid. So um, part of this was dovetailing from last year's discussions, where one of the recommendations from the SAB to the DTC was that DTC become a t and &E clearinghouse. Uh, but um, Part of the discussion we had today was just what exactly should uh, T&E involve for DTC? Like what are the things or thing, whether that be uh, just more limited area modeling, global modeling, all of the above, just figuring out where exactly DTC strengths best lie in terms of physics or process-based testing and evaluation with the tools that DTC specializes in and supports. That's that's my interpretation. Others, please feel free to correct me or add to what I've shared. But to that, I will also add that uh, some of the examples of T&E that were provided in the read ahead materials from what you all have been working on over the past year uh, since the last meeting were really helpful. They connect to some of the SAB recommendations, and I think that's really good to see. Um, and I think there's maybe some hope that what DTC does testing and evaluation-wise may not always be just what the Air Force or just what NOAA or other uh, funding partners might want, but that DTC could either on their own or in collaboration with the broader community uh, delineate a few strategic priorities in uh, physics and process-based testing and evaluation that they could then move forward on from here. So part of what we've always hoped for from our science advisory board is, is to have some recommendations of areas that um, we would dig into and, and work with the community on. And, and we have been, it, when we have so little money <laughs> that we can set aside for testing evaluation, it's, it's rather difficult to um, really be able to engage on that front. Um, but my, my hope is that over the next um, couple of years that, that that piece of that pie is going to get bigger. And so therefore coming up with um, sort of strategic ways of thinking about this um, that we can be preparing to go down those pathways and, and developing those connections with the community. So while we might not currently have the ability to do some of these things, I, I, I think we want to have a vision and, a, and, and some stretch goals as to, you know, how we want to, where we want to be in the next three to five years and build towards that gradually as we gradually pivot towards having more um, money that we can dedicate towards testing evaluation. So the evolution is not going to happen overnight, but we also don't, I, I also think it's, it's good if we can do this gradual turn from the standpoint that we can start planning and working towards that and, and um, be really ready to engage by the time we get to that point. Yeah, I completely agree and completely understand, Louisa. And I think that some of the specific recommendations that SAB, and I'm speaking only for myself at this point and not for anybody else uh, on the SAB, but some of the things that we outlined in last year's uh, recommendations in terms of specific things like boundary layer processes uh, over warm season continental environments that I think you all have done a little bit on this year and hope to do a little bit more moving forward. Or taking some of the suggestions from the MEG, uh, 
model evaluation group at EMC, um, kind of coming back down the gates uh, that Hendrick showed yesterday, are remain fruitful avenues for DTC to consider pursuing moving forward. Um, and I think there's a lot of the expertise to do some of these things already in place. But yeah, the point about needing to free up the resources and the time and money to be able to do this is well taken. And, and I would encourage you to, um, you know, recommendations that you had last year, um, you know, restating ones that you feel like are still relevant or, or elaborating on them more in this year's report are, are totally appropriate. So we can, you know, consistency and guidance and we can, we can push that, you know, out to our management board and our executive committee, you know, this, this is the track that the SAB still feels like we should be on that kind of thing. I think, I think that's all totally appropriate. Um, so you can recycle some of it if you want, if you still feel like it's appropriate. Good to know. Thank you, Louisa. And I suspect there's a lot, there's probably broader foci that this year's SAB might be able to come up with, but uh, I'm not sure if those discussions have taken place during the times that I wasn't be able to, wasn't able to participate. So I'll mute myself and shut up and let others uh, contribute. Thanks. Okay. Any other thoughts that, on, on this topic? Otherwise we'll move on. Okay, I guess, uh, a couple more here. Um, uh, the hierarchical, hierarchical framework, um, is it missing a few pieces? I think um, th this was on, uh, ongoing work, uh, streamlining the, 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 the framework uh, to add uh, some additional uh, steps uh, from single column model to full or, or uh, to full um, global coupled model. Um, adding a few steps in the pieces, uh, uh, 2D models, idealized models, um, it, uh, as, as steps in, in, in the process. And uh, I think the feedback on, on improving or, or, or I guess developing the process is already open and we're just recommending to, to continue, continue, the, uh, continue that development. So I, and I, I will follow up on this point. I did, I, while you guys were discussing, I was able to review the Slack, all the conversations on Slack. And, and, and definitely, I think we need to, when we present that hierarchy, that not all the pieces are smoothly there yet. So right. um, we, need, we need to better communicate that and, and then also get feedback from the community about you know, the importance of those other steps in that I, ideal world of being able to do all that testing so that then uh, we can communicate priorities throughout the uh, UFS community funding frame or whatever about um, being able to fill in some of those blanks. Um, if the community really feels like those are going to be important to make progress, then um, that's useful input um, for us with respect to going back to our, our partners and, and even communicating that up into the general uh, UFS development um, realm sort of thing. Okay. Anybody have any other comments on that front? Okay. Okay. And then the last one is a um, big item was that uh, DC, TTC could uh, provide a way of accessing uh, data, accessing uh, data sets that aren't readily available to the community outside of uh, NOAA and NSEP and others um, that uh, um, that it's you know a little uh, difficult for you know people from academia and private industry to you know to gain uh, certain data data sets um, and DTC um, could you know provide channels into those uh, into those data sets to make them uh, you know easily accessible. And uh, I'm not sure how, I imagine DTC is already, you know, providing that service, but maybe um, somehow um, uh, could the process could be streamlined or, or, uh, or improved. So I, I, I would say we probably aren't 
really, and my staff can correct me if I'm wrong, like providing open access, like a nice portal to come in and access data. Um, I guess the, the big question for me would be um, how aware, so NOAA is putting a, a, a significant amount of data on the cloud with three of the um, cloud provider services. Um, and, and I'm just wondering how aware the community is or whether you don't feel like that is accessible or is, or is the problem that you can't do your work on the cloud yet. And so um, having that data on the cloud uh, really isn't being helpful to you. Because um, I don't want to do some, I mean, so there's, there's sort of, I'm trying to figure out, I, I understand we've tried to inform people about where you can get data sets. Um, and I know there are restricted type data sets too, which makes this sort of difficult. Um, but, you know, trying to figure out there are movements within the community to make um, data accessible, whether it's observations or model data um, and, and trying to figure out whether it's just a lack of communication or whether the pathways that are being used aren't really being helpful. So, so trying to give some feedback um, with respect to that. Does anybody have any thoughts from, especially Since I led this yeah. comment, which again, I'm not gonna take full credit for, I think Christiane was the first to bring this up. Um, so there's two things here. One is, you know, there's, there's two types of data sets, I should say. There are um, kind of experimental forecast data sets. Um, you know, think of a UFS, a set of a suite of UFS runs that of an experimental version that is not operational yet. I don't think that kind of stuff is going in the cloud yet. Is am I correct on that, Louisa? Um, I'm. I saw Curtis on here for a minute, and did he drop? Uh, Curtis Alexander, did you drop off? Are you there? Because I I thought maybe there was some. There you are. I'm here. You, what's the uh, question about <laughs> the cloud allocation? Is there some experimental um, like configurations of the UFS that are being put on the cloud for access by the community? Uh, yes, in that I believe the um, application release for the short range weather was tested on cloud platforms and we are running a version of it that's mimicking a uh, future operational uh, instantiation on uh, Amazon Cloud. Uh, and the data that's being produced from that is being shipped off to the NOAA, uh, I think it's the big data pool. So yeah, yeah we, we are running and producing output on the cloud that's accessible and has been looked at in things like the hazardous weather test bed spring experiment. Okay. So there's there's some, but maybe not enough. Um, yeah, but I mean, helping to raise awareness in the community of what data sets are available, how you know tools for the community to access those data sets. Um, okay. You know, I'm, I'm thinking again from a from an academic perspective. You know, we can't always afford to run these big models in the in the configuration, and so. If we have knowledge of what data sets are out there and how to access and tools to access those data sets, you know, you're opening it up to the, the larger academic community to be able to come in and do some of this T and E work along again partnering with with DTC to do this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point. And there are a lot of NOAA data sets on the cloud that are publicly accessible from operational model output. So um, that is definitely a a point that we should follow up on about messaging the information about where and what all these data sets are. And I'm and I'm going to guess, and I will. I see two hands up, so we'll, we will get to that in just a minute. But I am going to guess that having the ability to do analysis of those data sets on the cloud is probably um, needs to be a focus because you don't want to be downloading all those big data sets um, onto your local machine because I think there are costs associated with pulling the data down. Some of those, well, there can be, um, but many of those NOAA data sets, I believe, have free egress on them, at least at this point. That might change down the road, but um, that's a great point, though. Yep. Okay. 
So let's see, Tara, it looks like you had your hand up first. Yeah, um, towards that end, um, you know, once again, uh, we are in the process of, of um, establishing that plus, at least on the Amazon web service um, and um, putting together a, a AMI, an Amazon web service machine image, so that um, people from the community, whether it's students or if it's, you know, researchers or, or whatever, can actually go up to the cloud um, with their own credentials, uh, mirror the AMI, and then um, get started using um, MET Plus to do analysis, to do testing and evaluation. Um, and so um, that's the the building blocks for that will be this this um, tutorial series that we're we're putting together. Hopefully, that will help um, with getting some of the community um, up into the cloud and and um, being able to access not only the models but also the observations that are up there. Um, it's a small step forward, but hopefully it will be, um, you know, a meaningful step forward. Okay, Christiana? Yeah, I want to. I want to follow up. Uh, yeah, on the data portal, I think that was also uh, listed in my presentation. Um, it would be, and I think it's super low hanging fruit, and DTC could step in if there are resources. Um, a pure website platform how it doesn't need to be a sophisticated portal would even help at this time to orient the community towards the cloud resources. And I see the confusion, even Jamie just commented here in the chat that she thinks that there are some data from the hazardous weather testbed, but she also wasn't sure. So maybe even the NOAA community isn't quite sure what's out there. Curtis mentioned, yeah, there's maybe something. So I think a easy access web web link, I guess, from the DTC webpage uh, to give orientation where the data are, which data are available over which time periods. I know this will be in flux, of course, as maybe the cloud resources are ramped up. What are maybe tools that are available already? Um, it's not about replicating any data. It's uh, and, and hopefully we can maybe even point to observations that are made available via the cloud. Uh, it's just, again, uh, giving guidance where to even look. Also, Curtis, uh, I know that, if you're still online, that you put, or uh, GSL puts, a lot of the analysis that, you know, the current uh, short-range weather application uh, puts out plots and analysis already, I think, on a web page. Even that could be linked. These are prepared figures, of course, but even that could help the community instead of just looking at na naked data. It would also be helpful to point to actual analysis that you know, already has been done at NOAA and just provide the link to easily, you know, provide guidance how to find it. Is this true, Curtis? That no, you're right. That yeah. um there some of that might not be available at this point. It might just be the gridded data itself. Um, but having you know some visualization of that um also accessible would be yeah. probably helpful to users. Um I think this speaks to a broader issue here that we need to follow up on about providing the information of what exactly is available and where do you get it? Does it cost anything uh, from all the NOAA data sets that may be um, now on the cloud stored somewhere? So we do need to have a comprehensive uh, resource to point to all that information and explain what it is. Right. Also, there the uh, global application, the medium range weather application, uh, we are currently in these development phases. They call it prototypes. Uh, current version is prototype seven. These are, you know, not released versions. Uh, we will be running, and, and NOAA is running their own ensemble or their own suite of experiments. Typically, they end up in HPSS, and nobody can access these except NOAA, yeah. uh, people with NOAA accounts. There is mm -hmm. one instance, P5, prototype five, which is on the cloud. Um, I believe how to find as well. So it's about communication yeah? and mm -hmm. maybe realizing that a lot of things are not for the community, uh, not accessible behind the firewall. Yeah, so, and I saw, I think I saw a comment in the chat from Tara about um, Epic Swim Lanes. So, um, so I, I, even if this kind of thing ended up being in the Epic court, I, I think it's totally fine to mention this need from the community in our science advisory board report. And then we can work closely with Maui to, to figure out whether this is something that, um, you know, that, that Epic, I mean, Epic's going to be looking for some early wins. 
um, let me say, I mean, any anything that's spinning up wants an early win, right? And um, and so being able to provide some feedback about what, what some really um, immediate needs are from the community so that they can engage, um, you know, then, then we can figure out where it's going to land. And and thank you for the clarification, because I see I hear data portal and I'm thinking that we have to buy a big, you know, disk space and load data somewhere and provide access to it. So understanding that what you're talking about is a portal of, you know, this is what is available and this is where you go, you know, you can go access it is, is very helpful. That's a helpful clarification. I um, appreciate that. So. And just to follow on, I put a link in the chat uh, here that's got a now becoming a fairly comprehensive list of at least the NOAA uh, big data uh, program uh, data sets and what those look like uh, in terms of where to get them and some of those details. So I would definitely use that as a jumping off point. I realize that's not going to probably cover all the detailed information that users might want to have, but um, Noah's certainly trying to get all that information together. Okay. Well, those are the those are the main items. Um, uh, uh, a couple of others. Um, uh, something that came up in our discussion was uh, streamlining the DTC visitor program, um, increasing recruitment and publicity, uh, making make, making virtual options more prominent or available for remote visitors. Um, let's see, removing administrative hurdles for non-sabbatical visitors. Example, allow um, for at least some indirect costs to be charged so visitors can retain their local healthcare, 401k, fringe benefits, and pay for administrative costs of moving for moving. Um, let's see. Yeah, so let's see. So streamlining the DTC visitor program. So does anyone want to elaborate? I haven't had any uh, personal uh, experience with the, with, with the visitor program, so I can't speak any more about maybe it. It's a big question, even is it well funded or Luisa maybe can comment. So, so we have plenty of funds. So when we say that the announcement is open year round is people can apply whenever. It's not like there's an open, like that we open for applications in one month, you know, we, we, we accept them, then we review all of them and we award. Um, in, instead, because when we did that, um, we seemed to get a lot of applicants that weren't really relevant, and um, and and then we, you know, we we'd almost feel like we had to award. You know, if you're going to award the full, all the money that we'd set aside for the program, then you would end up with ones that were less of a fit. Um, so so basically, the way it works right now is that it, it's an open call. You can apply whenever. Um, and then, you know, and and I'm going to apologize that we were working on getting our announcement of opportunity updated and then publicizing it again. And then um, I got busy with this. <laughs> um, and uh, so what what we're trying to work towards is updating that announcement of opportunity so that what topics are highlighted in there are very relevant um, to what we're currently working on. Um, but we probably could advertise better. And I do understand that there are um, that some aspects of the program are um, not ideal for engaging certain parts of the community. So um, I'll, I'll need to explore it. Part of it stems from the way we get the funding that we dedicate to the visitor program that that provides that ends up providing some of those restrictions, and and also ends up that because we have to pay overhead on the money that then goes out it's it we we don't do it as like a subcontract so it's not like we give the funding to the visitor instead we pay for things directly for the visitor and and we actually do and maybe this needs to be incorporated into um the announcement more so we do provide opportunities for people to come to interact with us virtually they i mean especially this past year but even before that, um, visitors would interact with our team throughout the year. Um, and, and that the two months could be 
Um, we have people who come for a couple of weeks at the beginning of the year and then, you know, a couple of weeks in the middle and then, um, you know, a time period towards the end. So it's not like you have to cordon out like two months to come visit us because um, we totally understand that, it, you know, sometimes for professors, the two two months in Boulder, they they find that ideal. And but whereas sometimes they don't because of um, commitments at home. Um, so yeah so i i i definitely would welcome any input that you have about how to encourage more visitors how to advertise and what kind of things we need to entertain with respect to um how we can revamp the visitor program because i i while it's had certain aspects of success i i think it's not been maxed out with respect to its success so um and maybe part of it's communication. <laughs> um, Luis, in that announcement, do you actually list what some of the previous um, visitor, pro visitor um, successful visitor program uh, participants have been and what they've been so that people in the community know what kinds of things are getting funded? So on our visitor, the, the, the tab for our visitor program, all of our past projects are listed on there and the reports from those projects and the seminars they've given are all linked in there. So, um, so that, that is all there, but once again, you know, if uh, Christiana, you sounded like you went in and looked at it. If there's I, did, any... I, I did see that. Yeah, no, they're yeah. Right. Uh, so, everything is posted. Um, yeah, so that's good. I, I just thought, you know, you had two this year, and that's maybe the, the number you have for this year. And I guess in the past, I had even reviewed one or two of these applications. I hadn't seen anything like that this year. So is there anything planned for next year? It's it's a little bit dwindling, but COVID maybe interferes. So I so, so COVID is part of the yeah. problem. Yeah. Um, we, and I, ha I have to admit, because of the COVID restrictions, we have not been, um, actively recruiting as much as we we would have in the past it it, it has yeah. while we've been able to still maintain support for our current visitors um because we still have two or three projects that are are finishing up um it it has been a little less uh, appealing to really try and vigorously recruit but we have also proof that we can interact with our visitors remotely um and so we we do need to um and given with the way things are going, we need to reinvigorate our recruitment because we don't know when things are going to settle down, um, sort of thing. And we do have unallocated funds for the visitor program, so um, it, it speaks to us reinvigorating our our recruitment, sort of thing. Are there any other questions or comments on the visitor program? And, and I would definitely, if anybody has feedback on our website, um, things that, I mean, I, this has been very helpful um, hearing, you know, training's too hard to find, um, that kind of stuff, then um, we totally welcome that because we want our website to be a good place to um, find out about us. And, and, and it, is, it, it is a work in progress about updating it right now. Um, but the one part that I thought we had done that we were almost finished with was our community codes part and now we're hearing feedback that that a couple of things are are too hidden so um we'll need to we'll need to rethink some of revamp some of that i mean that that'll that I, i'm i'm guessing that the content is good it's just we need to we'll just need to redo the navigation a little bit so anyway um let's see any any other thoughts to share before we wrap it up? Um, no, I don't think so. I think those were the main uh, main main uh, topics that came up. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for addressing all of them. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I want to thank all of you. It's been great. You've been so engaged, and and I. Um, we, I, I have to admit that when I did the survey about availability, I, I did not think we were going to end up being able to have as many of you engaged for the two full two days as we have. So I was very excited about that. 
Um, so my um, my charge to the SAB now is to, um, if you could, say over the next month at the most, um, work together about putting together a written report um, because this is important for, um, while our funding comes in all these different parsements and periods of performance, this meeting does kick off our main part of our planning process. And we do like to incorporate um, your feedback, your input into that process and also provide that input to our management board and our executive committee so that they can help us with uh, some strategic planning about directions about where we're headed. Um, and so not having that, not having too long of a delay between when we have this meeting and when we actually have the report um, is helpful for keeping that process moving forward fluidly. Um, and, and as you're working on that, if there's any other questions that come up, um, I'm always available. You can get in touch with me. Um, and if I can't answer all the questions, I can always channel it out to the staff. Um, and we can keep conversations going on the Slack channel. Um, you know, whatever, whatever you need in order to feel like you're making um, the most informed, um, actionable recommendations, um, that, that helps us sort of thing. So, okay. Anything else? All right. You know what would be great? Jenny, are you, can, can you do a quick screen capture if people could come off their, uh, put, turn their cameras on? Um, I know we've lost a few people, but um, I'd like to have a quick screenshot if we can. Yep, so, let me know when you're ready. <laughs> all right. Oh, come on, ladies from my staff. You guys, turn your cameras on too, please, please. <laughs> there we go. And you can tell it's actually raining out here in Colorado because everybody's rooms are not all well lit up. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a cave right now. So anyway, all right, Jenny, I think we're ready. you get it? Yep. Is she there? I, I think I got it. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm having a problem here. I don't oh, know no. <laughs> oh, hold on. Okay, there. I just can't figure out how now to save it. I apologize. I was using my other computer before when I was doing the screenshots. So... I will figure this out though. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hang on, I'm gonna see if I can do it real quick. Where, where, where? I've got too many windows open. Dun, dun, dun. All right, I've almost got it. Oh, not that. Oh, scary. That just screwed everything up. This is when. This is what happens when you have two displays open. You know what? I think I can do it. I've got it and I can crop it. So we are set. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for all the engagement. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.